is marking the fifth anniversary of the death of Michael Brown Jr. this morning. The unarmed black teenager was shot by a white police officer who says Brown attacked him. A grand jury decided not to indict the officer. Brown's death led to months of protests and drew attention to police practices nationwide. Jeff Begays has been reporting on policing in America five years after Ferguson all week. He's in Ferguson. Jeff, what can we expect today? Well, good morning. Behind me, this is where Michael Brown was shot and killed five years ago. And you can see here in the middle of the street, there is a growing memorial because they will honor his life this weekend with a memorial service. But there will also be calls for justice and continued changes in policing. As you know, earlier this week, we told you about our ongoing investigation, which looked at police practices since Michael Brown's death. Our investigation revealed changes that police departments across America say that they're making to confront possible racial bias. We reached out to more than 150 departments in big cities nationwide and found that 57% of those who say they have implicit bias training added it after Ferguson, but most said that they don't have a way to measure its success. We recently sat down with Michael Brown's father, Michael Brown Sr. Policing has changed, in your view, in those five years? So-so. So-so? Yeah. So you don't think there's been enough change? No, nah, it could be more. So clearly he doesn't think that there has been enough change in policing across the country and here in Ferguson. He will have a press conference, and we expect that he will call for his son's case to be reopened. Black Minds Matter is the focus of our class, and um, this is a public course. And this third year, 2020, I have the pleasure of co-hosting the class. So um, about the professors, again, this is being led by J. Luke Wood, um, and then I am secondary in terms of co-hosting Black Minds Matter 2020. You are, um, those who uh, sign up are getting continuing education units. That link right there at, uh, toward the left um, would be very helpful for you. So you can purchase items, for example, t-shirts, Black Minds Matter by Shante Needham, sister of Sandra uh bland and you can go to facebook uh, and do that you can also uh get t-shirts and other items from our scholarship matters.com and there is an intentional focus on broadening the awareness of diversity and giving voice to those who are minoritized we cannot um, say enough about our partnering organizations. There are several listed there. You can see them, so I won't reiterate who they are. But thank you to the organizations who did um, partner with us, the sponsors. But also thank you to those who have signed up for the course. There is nothing like Black Minds Matter. You, you can't find anything else like this, and I'm happy to be a part of this class. All right, everyone, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our speakers for the day. Our first speaker is William A. Smith. William Smith is a full professor and department chair in the Department of Education, Culture, and Society at the University of Utah. He also holds a joint appointment in the Ethnic Studies Program, African American Studies Division, as a full professor. He has served as the Associate Dean for Diversity, Access, and Equity in the College of Education, as well as a Special Assistant to the President at the University of Utah and its NCAA Faculty Athletics Representative. His research primarily focuses on his theoretical contribution of racial battle fatigue, which is the cumulative emotional, physiological, psychological, and behavioral effects that racial level microaggressions and macro level aggressions have on people of color. Our next speaker after this will be Dr. Frank Harris III. Dr. Harris is a professor of post-secondary education and co-director of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab, SEAL, 
at San Diego State University. He is best known for his expertise in racial inequity in post-secondary education and has made important contributions to knowledge and college student development and the social construction of gender and race in college contexts. His work prioritizes populations that have been historically underrepresented and underserved in education. He has delivered more than 500 academic and professional presentations throughout his career. Our next speaker will be Dr. Ebony Zamani Gallagher. Dr. Zamani Gallagher is professor of higher education and community college leadership. She is the director of the Office for Community College Research and Leadership, OCCRL. Zamani Gallagher previously served as the associate head of the Department of Education Policy, Organization and Leadership and Associate Dean of the Graduate College at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She currently serves as the Executive Director of the Council for the Study of Community Colleges, CFCC. And our final speaker for the day is Michael Brown Sr. Michael Brown Sr. is the father of Michael Brown Jr. who was killed at the hands of law enforcement and will be here today to draw parallels between policing and education. We are grateful to our speakers for joining us today. I am, this is Donna Y. Ford from Ohio State University. I am a distinguished professor of education and human ecology, and I am thrilled to again present about um, Black Minds Matter this time in the context of special education and discipline with black students. And actually it's really more black males, but I'll keep it as black students. I wanna share some data, contributing factors and some recommendations. Questions I want you to consider, again, in the context of Black Minds Matter is how should we define overrepresentation? Yeah. Pardon me? How should we def let, let, let me start over because I thought you said something to me. So let's start over, Luke. Luke? Okay, there we go. I am having uh, connection challenges. Let me, I'm mean, I, I to- Yeah, I just thought I heard you say Don and I'm like, uh oh, okay. So I'll start no, over when you no, no, no. Yeah, I need, to, I need to just start over and it's, it's not you, it's, it's my computer, so- Okay. That's okay. I trapped my grandson and my mother. Be quiet, but it is what it is. <laughs> Just tell me when you're ready. Okay, anytime. Feel free to start over. Okay, I'm starting. My name is Donna Y. Ford, and I am a distinguished professor of education and human ecology in the College of Education and Human Ecology at Ohio State University. Uh, I am thrilled to co-host Black Minds Matter with Dr. J. Luke Wood. My topic today um, is special education and discipline. I, I'm saying black students, but there's an emphasis on black males. I wanna look at data, contributing factors, and then some recommendations. So questions I want us cons to consider is how should we define overrepresentation? What degree of overrepresentation is acceptable? And by the way, for me, there's no degree that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. Is overrepresentation something that's bad? Because people, and there are a couple, I'm not gonna name them here, a couple of people who think that black students should be more represented in special education than they are. And I've taken them on in social media and other places. What are the difference between is there a difference, um, be, the difference versus disordered notion needs to be considered. Uh, what is normal versus abnormal and who is the norm from which we make comparisons? So I'll be talking about race and cultural considerations, income and SCS considerations. Uh, SES, for those who don't know, it means social economic status and then gender considerations. So terminology is important. And what bothers me 
is that um, some sometimes or too often in special education, the degree of overrepresentation is diluted under the notion of disproportionality. I use that term sometimes, but I'm very clear. I'm talking about overrepresentation when it comes to special education and discipline. I'm not talking about gifted education right now. It will be underrepresentation. So the pre-referral process, how do children come to special education? First, there is concern, most likely by teachers, sometimes by uh, families, if they know anything about special education. Then there's a referral to a student support team. Uh, there's a limited evaluation. There is some type of intervention and then um, if there's continued concern, then there's referral to special education. So this is like an RTI response to intervention uh, model. But what I wanna say here is that piece that talks about concern is problematic when it comes to black males and females due to racism, implicit biases, explicit um, biases and more. So the concern I'm arguing is often unwarranted. And I wanna say that again, the concern is often unwarranted, but it begins the prison to school pipeline. Teachers who don't know our cultural styles, et cetera, believe that there is a problem with us and they refer us unnecessarily for evaluation. I want that to be really, really clear. So the major issues are false positives. And so we have disproportionate representation. We have overrepresentation by race and definitely race and gender. So race, black, and then male. Uh, my concerns are about the judgmental and subjective categories, the high incidence areas, where there's reliance on intelligence testing, placement is in most um, cases re in restrictive environments. And um, I don't have slides that really go into that. So let me just say when I say when I'm referring to um, restrictive environments, I'm I'm talking about that um, segregated environments where black students are not um, in classrooms with white students. Uh, and more. I mean, that's that's another presentation. And then we have the most stigmatized labels and these special education areas. So the categories that concern me the most regarding Black students are high incidence areas. So developmental delay, which definitely um, is pre to three, pre to um, third grade, um, early childhood, which begins the school to prison pipeline. It is my professional belief that once you get some kind of label as developmental delay, that you will get some other labels that will disrupt your future and will um, contribute to the school to prison pipeline. The other area is intellectually delayed, uh, delayed, I'm sorry, and used to be called mentally, and I don't even wanna say it, but MR, because I was always offended by that term. So IQ, um, we are considered less intelligent than white students. A third area that really concerns me is emotional and behavioral disorder. And this is where I wanna spend the most of my time. Last, I mean, last or fourth would be other health impairments and that will be ADHD. So attention um, deficit hyperactivity disorder, which, I, which is very problematic and um, as the other areas are. There's one category, this um, low incidence area that um, troubles me, and that's the language disorders. So I didn't put it here, but I wanna stress that too many teachers believe that when black students, which or black people, 
which is the majority of us, including myself, although I consider myself bilingual, I speak black English when it um, is to my advantage. And as I'm doing now, I speak mainstream English when it is to my advantage. But too many people believe that black English is inferior, substandard, and requires special education needs and services. And I'm saying 100%, I totally disagree. Now that's in the low incidence area, black English. So, you know, concerning bias intelligence tests, there's just so much out there that's controversial. But I want to um, say that when I, when I speak about bias intelligence test, I'm looking at the verbal loading, which is in favor of high income whites and then what they call the cultural or social loading, which is again in favor of high income whites. So these items on intelligence test are just extremely racist, extremely biased, and very in favor of those who are, those whites who are high income and white. And it's a badge of honor. Some of you may not know this. I don't know, even know if you know this, Dr. Wood, but when I have done evaluations for gifted programs, we have white parents buying the IQ scores of their children. They will pay hundreds to go to a psychologist who will give them a high IQ score so their children will be identified as gifted and not in need of special education. And I consider this somewhat of an epidemic. It's not a pandemic, but it's an epidemic and it's problematic. Biased intelligence test and then paid IQ scores. So one teacher may not tolerate a child taking out of talking, I'm sorry, out of turn, and may deem the child abnormal, whereas another may accept the same behavior as viable and normal classroom interaction. Classroom cultures routinely include features that mark children as deviant, even in the absence of any visible handicap. We are dealing with one thing mainly, and that is subjectivity. We are primarily talking about white teachers and white female teachers more specifically, who are misreferring and mislabeling um, and disrupting our black children's future, especially black, more, black males. So implications for overrepresentation. Miseducation has to be um, discussed. So black students are inappropriately labeled and classified. We black students receive services that do not meet our needs. We are denied access to general education curriculum, which often results in tracking Black students face the lowest expectations of any student groups, especially our males. Black students have the lowest rate or rates of school success, which um, contributes to dropout, or which you can see, I'm sorry, in dropout rates, graduation rates, college enrollment, and definitely the prison pipeline is primed. Retention, no fair. African Americans were 16% of our sixth through eighth grade public school students in the year that is shown, 2009 to 10. Yet, we, black, stu black students, black people, uh, accounted for 42% of students held back in those grades. So, retention is a problem. Oh, by the way, I am not saying I am a proponent for um, social promotion. What I am saying is social promotion 
is inequitable is it then does not take into consideration the racism that exists in our schools. Uh, so I want to share this chart about ninth grade retention. Um, it says about 6% of all ninth grade students are held back or retained in um, the ninth grade. 12% of black and 9% of American Indian and Native Alaskan students repeat the ninth grade. So more on discrimination based on race. False positives are running rampant. So we have overrepresentation, especially among black males. We have overrepresentation um, among low SES or income students. We have overrepresentation based on biases, stereotypes, racism, anti blackness. And again, as I said, we need to interrogate instruments, policies, and procedures be uh, for their disparate impact. Racial discipline gap. Despite alternatives that would help students on campus and learning, schools suspend black students at a rate that is over three times that for white students. So here's an example where it says in 2009, 2010, nearly one out of every three black students in high schools were suspended compared to their white students. And even more updated, it increased from three times to 3.8, almost four times likely to be suspended or expelled as white students. Racism is undeniable. No matter what you say, racism and fear of black students, but more specifically black males is undeniable. At the bottom of the screen, it says a new study from Yale found that in pre that pre K teachers, um, white and black alike, spend more time watching, monitoring, putting a telescope on black boys, expecting them to be troublemakers, and this is clearly problematic to put our children, our black children, especially our black boys under a microscope is um, indicative of racism and a need for revolution. So this is on early childhood, which primes the pipeline. So disparity in discipline starts in preschool. And so here's a study summarized that talks about four-year-olds getting suspended I don't want to use too much of our time, but I do want you to notice that. Look at overall. Black students are, what, 18% at preschool level? But with out-of-school suspension, it goes to 42% and so for one time and then for multiple times. I just got to say this. Um, I usually have a hard time presenting without cursing. So let me just say this word. How the hell could our babies, barely out of diapers, be so objectified and treated with such injustice at this age? Now, that's not a rhetorical question. That's a question that I'm saying you don't need to consider this. Uh, racism, intentional bias, unintentional bias is at work. Um, so here's a few charts from the um, Office of Civil Rights Data. So school discipline, it talks about rates of suspension by race and ethnicity. I'll just give you a minute to look at it. Uh, but we are uh, located uh, in the yellow section, and it's, pro it's a problem. The same with out-of-school suspension, to repeat myself, but to share um, data. And this is just not about preschool, this is about all students. Arrests and referrals to law enforcement. So here we go, school to prison pipeline, special education, prison pipeline, 
discipline to school, um, uh, I'm sorry, discipline to um, prison pipeline, white teachers, especially white female teachers to the prison pipeline. Hey, look at this. I mean, it, it just says it all. Have a good day, Jimmy. Protect and serve. I've got my eyes on you, Jamal. Control and patrol. That's real talk. So our white children are innocent until proven guilty, and our black children are guilty until proven innocent, if they are ever proven innocent. Here's another one. And um, this should remind you of George Floyd and others. So students, unfortunately, uh, attend schools with too few um, counselors, especially counselors of color and culturally competent counselors. But we have a hell of a lot of resource officers. I repeat, we have a hell of a lot of resource officers, but not enough school counselors who are culturally competent and or who are black. Now, I would be remiss if I did not share um, Jay Lookwoods and um, Harris the Third and Howard's Get Out Report, their report on black male suspensions in California public schools. Uh, what I want to say is, yeah, they shared this data, but they also give recommendations that I don't have time to present here. So I don't just want to complain. I'm saying there are also resources out there. So Get Out is a fantastic must-read report. Girlhood Interrupted the Erasure of Black Girls' Childhood by these three authors also go into detail on the racist or racialized experiences of our Black girls in terms of suspension, expulsion, um, and the like. So with that said, I want to um, end by saying we need an educational revolution. We need an educational re revolution. Instructional programs that don't match the needs and learning styles of black students are prevalent. We need to interrogate definitions that lack cultural considerations in terms of special education and uh, discipline. We need to address ineffective uh, procedures used to refer and then classify students for special education services. Again, not culturally um, aware and sensitive. Um, there is a lack of knowledge about how to resolve students' problems and meet their needs. So we have to get more involved in teacher education and substantive um, professional development. There's too much cultural incompetence among educators, period. Whether we're talking about gifted education, special education, discipline, you name it, uh, curriculum, you name it, cultural competence is too prevalent. And undeniably racism and anti-blackness in society at large, and then in schools, is so pervasive. And I hope I made that clear in the uh, previous uh, slides. So we need an educational revolution. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide. So I'm gonna end with this, and it says, the essence of the problem is, and this is by Banks, we need to create democratic and just schools, colleges, and universities. The established concepts and knowledge system used was not privilege any particular racial, ethnic, social class, or gender group, but must reflect the experiences of the diverse groups that make up 
the nation. We must do better. And Black Minds Matter is what this is about. I'm going to end with that quote and say, as I've said in previous um, places, including Black Minds Matter uh, presentations, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. United Negro College Fund, a mind is a terrible thing to erase, and we must do better with our Black students, uh, especially our males, and we can do better. And if we don't do better, you're definitely part of the problem, not the solution. All right, everyone, we are very, very excited today to have Dr. William A. Smith, the creator of the concept of racial battle fatigue. So we have enabled the slides, so you should be able to, to share, and we're just going to go ahead and, and, and have you jump right in. Okay, so let me uh, see if I can share. Okay, here we go. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, racial battle fatigue, but also the psychosocial antecedents of racial battle fatigue. So in my work, I really um, am indebted to Philomena Essence's uh, term of gendered racism, because I think that gives us a richer ability to really examine uh, the data and the impact of how black women, black men are experiencing racism on campuses and in the larger society. Now, I've said in many occasions that anti-Black racism is global and it is a public health crisis. And I know Dr. Ford says this is one of the first uh, pandemics. So it's, it's really consistent with that um, discussion about how is it that Black people are living in a mundane environment that is embedded with institutionalized white supremacy. So in order to understand that, I look at anti-Black racism. And from my perspective, there's many definitions of anti-Black racism. But this one is most useful for me. And it's an injurious and specific stressor that pose violent threats to the biological, psychological, physical, cultural, and social health of the associated and associated interlocking identities of the black person. So this could be anti-black misogyny, anti-black misandry, and anti-black homophobia. So we have to understand that anti-black racism is an act of violence. I don't think we do enough uh, or give enough credit uh, to what we have to deal with as black people. When we talk about black minds matter, the black mind matters, the black body matters, the black spirit matters, and we are constantly under attack. There is no stereotype more anti than anti-black because it is global. So how do we respond? What is the overall attack on black people? So we must stop treating anti-black racism as just discrimination, but it's an act of genocide. What does this do for us? First, we have a psychosocial orientation, right? So that psychosocial orientation is the racial socialization that we go through, what Big Mama taught us, what our uncles, what our parents taught us, what our cousin how to get over in a racist society. And what I mean by getting over, I'm talking about what are our responses? How do we um, adjust to a system that is anti-Black? We've always been told that we have to work twice as hard to get half as far, right? So that's part of this racial socialization. So we are racially socialized within our homes, by our parents, by our uh, relatives, but then we enter into a historically white environment. What does that is historically white environment do for us or do to us? First of all, if it's anti-Black, 
which most universities are. I don't know of any historically white institution that isn't anti-black. We will go through what is what I call a psychosocial disorientation. Now, this psychosocial disorientation is something that just kind of knocks us off our feet for a moment because we might not have been prepared for that racial attack. What we do next is we lean back on our racial socialization and that racial socialization hopefully will shorten this disorientation process and we get into a new uh, psychosocial orientation or an adaptive orientation. So we will find out what are the underground railroads to manipulating and getting, getting through that hostile environment. Some of those underground railroads will be the Black uh, Student Union, the Black Cultural House. It will be the Donna Fords on a, a college campus where we will seek her out to say, how do we deal with this hostile environment? So we need many Donna Fords. We need many uh, Luke Woods on these college campuses to help us with this psychosocial adjustment. So understanding the connections of racial microaggressions to racial battle fatigue. So there's a lot of words here, so let me just do this. Racial battle fatigue is the psychological, emotional, physiological overload in a racially hostile environment. So what happens here is this race-related stress is appraised as taxing or exceeding our available coping resources. And this puts us in an endangering, kind of disturbed person environment, racist relationship, okay? So what are some of the symptoms? The cause and stress response responses to racial battle fatigue. If you are in a hostile environment where you are constantly under attack, you're gonna have a psychological stress response, a physiological stress response, and emotional behavioral stress response. So some of those things will be, you'll get frustrated all the time. You'll, you might be shocked that something happened. Uh, you will deal with John Henryism or Jane Henryism. Um, some of the physiological stress responses will be high blood pressure, the inability to sleep. We're supposed to, when we go to sleep at night, recover. Our energy is supposed to be restored and prepare us for the next day. But when you're dealing with a hostile anti-black environment, what you experience during the day time when you're awake, you oftentimes carry that to sleep with you and it reoccurs in your dreams. And how do you have peace and restoration when you're thinking about what that hostile racist environment is going to have for you the next day? So oftentimes we don't recover. We're constantly in this fight mode. And that's why black people die earlier than white people because we have that additional burden of living in an anti-black, institutionally racist environment. So there's a lot of words there. So let me just um, highlight this. So last year, in 2019, there were 2,713 cases these were the highest incidents of, of race-related hate crimes ever recorded. One-fourth of those hate crimes were on college campuses. So 433 campuses um, had hate crimes. That's a 159% increase. Now, guess what? The vast majority of those hate crimes were anti-Black. So what we experience in the larger society is basically mirrored in the campus society. So we can never get away from an anti-Black environment. We send our children to college with the hopes and dreams of bettering themselves, uh, being able to get good grades, being able to uh, live out their dreams and benefit from the hard work and effort of being a A student, being, uh, as uh, Dr. Ford talks about, these highly gifted people, we all must be highly gifted if, we're, if we are doing well in a, a racist environment like this. I mean, the pressure that we have to deal with is so 
incredible that it's just amazes me how we um, continue to cope and persist. So when we look at this, what do we find happening on college campuses or people who have been in college? We see here that people who had some college experience are reporting more discrimination than those who have a high school diploma or less in all blacks in general. So going to college, getting a degree is not saving us from dealing with racism. Now, what, what are the experiences of black men on college and university campuses? Here's a picture of Jefferson Moon, a Harvard graduate. People don't see him like the person he is with the suit and tie and a successful black man, no matter how he looks, no matter how he dresses, no matter how, what uh, perfect vocabulary that he has, they see him like a thug. So you can wear a suit and tie and white racism will still treat you as they perceive you to be. That's part of this whole racial battle fatigue. Now, here's a study on height and, and fear and threat. At five foot four, police stop 4.5 black men for every white man. And it gets worse as you get taller. At five foot 10, police stop 5.3 black men for every white man. And I'm 6'3". So at 6'4", police stop 6.2 black men for every white man. So what this might tell you is what they saw in a little kid like Tamir Rice. What they saw, and these, these data, I'm sure, are very similar for black women in a Sandy Bland, a threat. I don't see you as human. I see you as something to be feared, something to be controlled. So Walter Allen, Lynette Danley, and I did a study to look at the experiences of black men. Then we did a follow-up study with Jaleel Bishop Mustafa, Chantel Jones, Tommy Curry, and Walter Allen again to look at some of the experiences of black men on college campuses. Here's some of the things that we found. Now this is racial microaggressions in campus academic spaces. One summer I was taking a physics course. I used to be an engineer. I went to the physics lab on Sunday to study on the computers. Our assignments were on a Play-Doh program. A university officer came into the computer lab and asked for my ID. I asked him why. He stated that someone called and reported a suspicious looking person entering the building. I laughed and said, oh really? I told him that I'm a student studying for an exam and I wouldn't even be able to log on to the computer if I wasn't enrolled in the class. He, the campus police officer, asked again for my ID. At this point, I handed him my ID. Wait, there's more. Then the officer asked, do you have another piece of ID? So what are the experiences of black people when their body can't be seen as a student? And they're in spaces where they're there to study, to work for an exam, but they're being controlled because of white fear and white stress. So white folks have been sending the police campus and local police to control black bodies. And they're only there to study, to excel, but they have to deal with this extra threat. Here's one on the criminal predator stereotype. I was on an elevator in some university building alone when a white woman got on. She looked at me and made a face like something smelled. Then she turned to face the door, real stiff, straight, staring straight ahead. I was behind her and to her right. After a few seconds, I saw her move her head, trying to peek back at me over her right shoulder. I guess she got nervous, not knowing what I was doing behind her. When she couldn't see me clearly from the slight turn, she squeezed her purse tight, then quickly switched it to the left hand. 
So many of us have had this experience, right? Once again, sending a message that you are a threat, that you are somebody to be feared. And what is the physiological, the emotional, and the behavioral responses to feeling like you're always seen as a criminal or a predator? This one is from the Assume the Position paper. And this is, uh, unfortunately, at UC Berkeley, where my last child is a student. But at Underhill, all last semester, almost every night, there's whites, there's Asians, and Underhill playing Frisbee or playing football or whatever have you at 1 o'clock in the morning. They are out there yelling, having a good time, and never having any problems. So me and my friends, all black males, are out there about to play some football. And it's like 11 o'clock. All of a sudden, UCBP sweeps up. First, it's one car. And then they get out the car, and it's like, we got some complaints. You guys need to leave. Mind you, there's about maybe 10 of us, and we're out there still just tossing the football around. Then after he there for about two minutes, all of a sudden, this from this entrance over here, we have two other squad cars swooping in on Underhill lot. This is Kyle from UC Berkeley. Now, just trying to relax, trying to, at a competitive university, so-called elite institution, trying to relax and enjoy yourself around friends, but 10 friends together that are black is a game. That's what it seemed like. So their bodies had to be controlled. And this is a space where whites and Asians use all the time for recreation. But black people cannot be seen as having a recreational uh, space. So what do we need to do? We need to realize, recognize, respond, and resist traumatization. So we have to realize that systemic and individual nature of racism how it causes racial battle fatigue and seeks re and seek resilient, adaptive coping strategy. We also have to recognize the signs and symptoms of racial battle fatigue in oneself, family, and group members. We need to be able to respond fully by using strength-based, acid-based coping strategies that are based in the healthy ethnic racial identity development. And lastly, we need to resist individual, institutional, and systemic efforts at racial re-traumatization. And that is through protective, proactive, and adaptive coping. Some of those things I lean real heavily on uh, Howard Stevenson here. Protective racial socialization are those beliefs that the world, we see the world as racially hostile. Now in that, he offers this racism awareness teaching. And we don't do this enough. We have to think about this. If we just look at the most recognized date of enslaved Africans coming to the U.S., being forced to the U.S., that was in 1619. Now, we know it was longer, about 100 years before that in Mexico. But 1619 to 1865, Black enslavement was about 61% of our history on this land. From 1865 to 1877, we had a smaller period where we had the Black codes. That's about 3% of our U.S. history. From 1877 to 1969, we had suffered under Jim Crow laws, which was about 23% of our history. And if we listen to Michelle Alexander, from 1969 to 2020, we have been suffering under a new Jim Crow for about 13% of our history. Now, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson says that now we're dealing with this neo uh, COINTEL Pro um, situation, which has started around 1980 to, this, to today. So if we have been suffering from these forms of oppression, what have been our counter moves to deal with them? 
have we been doing enough of this racism awareness teaching for our current generation of students? Have we been offering this proactive racial socialization, which might be in the forms of spiritual and religious coping, but definitely cultural pride reinforcement and extended family care, which we know has been so important. But more importantly, we need to focus on this adaptive racial socialization. And we need to understand that this world, this society is treating us in a very hostile way. And that we have to have a counter strategy that defends against the racial menticide and the racial battle fatigue for black people in the United States. So I'll stop there. Wow, you know, that's powerful. But now I think about, we have George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDay. What is the racial battle fatigue that comes from hearing these things and seeing these things regularly on the television day after day? Well, there's something I also call racial battle fatigue contagion. And that refers to this kind of mutual empathy shared between an individual or group members uh, and the harm that is placed in dealing with institutionalized white supremacy. So I don't have to be the person who was impacted directly with this gendered forms of racism. But the fact that it could have happened to me and that I could see myself in uh, a Sandra Bland, a Breonna Taylor, that my life could have been just easily taken, that impacts me. Yeah. Right? So what you have then is a similar physiological response as if you were there in that exact moment. And let me let me go back for a second to the sleep notion. So as we all know, our body still is active and responds when we are asleep. So the same kind of stimuli that impacts us in our waking moments impacts us during our sleeping. Mm -hmm. So if we have high blood pressure during the day, we're gonna have high blood pressure while we sleep. And it's gonna be activated because of those things that are occurring in society at large. So when I heard, because we didn't see about Breonna Taylor, I was impacted, I was angry. When we, two months later, when we saw um, Ahmaud Arbery's video, it made me even further angry. And then the knee on the neck of uh, our brother, um, George Floyd, right? Yeah. So how much can we take? I really appreciate what you're saying, um, Dr. Smith. I mean, I, there's so much that, uh, draws my attention, but I know we don't have time. So right. there's no place you can go as a black person and be free of racism. Right. So again, remember the body codes racism as a violent act. And so the university, the universities are complicit in that when they don't have a strategy to get rid of it. And most are weak in their strategizing of anti-black racism. Well, it may take, anyway, um, I'm thinking about post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. which now I'm calling present <laughs> traumatic stress disorder. Um, but do, what's the relationship, if any, do you see between that and racial battle fatigue? All the things that we experience are current. So for instance, with post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, a person can have a traumatic experience one time, then they have outcomes from that. They get removed from that hostile environment or that traumatic environment into a more healthy environment, and they can overcome their PTSD. And if they have people who can affirm their reality, especially in group settings, we found that veterans do much better when they are in a group with uh, a therapist who is also a veteran who can say, yeah, your experience was real. They can overcome that. We don't have the benefit or the luxury, I should say, of being in a post-racist society. So we're gonna have to continue to deal with trauma. 
And we have to understand that our body codes that every day. We need uh, more um, programs like this. We need more. We need to encourage uh, black researchers to study us more from an assets based approach. We cannot tolerate um, the deficit approaches toward black girls, black women, black men, and black boys. We must look at us from a cultural wealth perspective. And I think we must um, also reinforce that in what we do and how we act and show black love. Mm -hmm. Third. All day, every day, in Third. all settings. All right. All right, everyone, we are, are very pleased and blessed today to have the great Dr. Frank Harris III here as a guest on Black Minds Matter. Frank is a professor of post-secondary education at San Diego State University, and my close colleague and friend and brother in this work, uh, the vast majority of research that I've done in my career has been a partnership with this man you see right here, and I promise you he will not disappoint. So with that, I'm just going to turn the floor over to you, Dr. Harris, uh, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say about Black Minds Matter. Well, thank you, Dr. Wood. Now that you've inflated expectations beyond anything I could ever live up to, I'm going to dive in and do the best that I can here. But I do want to thank you, um, and I do want to first and foremost acknowledge that it's an honor and a privilege to be a part of this series, uh, especially when I think about folks like Tyrone Howard and Ebenezer Monty Galler and Gloria Latson Billings and some others who are contributing to this series at what is an absolutely critical time, not only in our country, but also in education and in the work that we do. And um, you know, I just really appreciate you and Dr. Ford for your leadership and your brilliance in making this happen. Um, as you know, Dr. Wood, my area of expertise is post-secondary education. And what I like to do is kind of offer some framing remarks about how black lives and black minds are policed in this context, as well as some salient trends and issues that you know you and I both have seen in this space um, in, in the nearly a decade that you and I have been working together. So I think it, the first thing to do is that we have to acknowledge that while the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and Tony McDade and Sean Reed and, and far too many others have sparked the national movement against anti-Blackness. Um, black lives and Black minds have never really ever been valued in this country. And what we see here is a small snapshot of the many racialized atrocities that have been enacted systematically to destroy Black lives and Black minds. And so this fight for racial justice for Blacks began centuries ago. And of course, it continues today for some very obvious and some very important reasons. And um, also we know that like, not like unlike any other social institution in the US, racism has been ingrained in the fabric of post-secondary education since its inception. So, you know, first when we think about the racially exclusive policies and practices that have kept people of color from participating equitably in post-secondary education, even to this very day, and then we also can think about it like this. The first black person to earn a college degree in the United States was Alexander Twilight, who graduated from Middlebury College in 1823. Now, some folks may think, wow, 1823, that was a long time ago. Well, not really when you think about the fact that it was 200 years after the first um, institution of higher education was established in the United States, which of course was Harvard in 1636. And so, you know, what we see here are presented on the screen and also in the next slide um, are dehumanizing portrayals of blacks by white students. So even, even once blacks had, were, were granted, you know, somewhat, I guess we can call it access uh, to post-secondary education, they still had to deal with things like this, right? These dehumanizing portrayals of black students by white students as in many ways, you know, what became, became a popular source of humor and entertainment for white students. And then, you know, some folks may be thinking, well, this was a really long time ago. You know, we could even fast forward to present day context, 2019, and see and also recognize that there's been somewhat of an uptick in campus-based 
hate against towards blacks, I would say since the election of Donald Trump, that that was an important milestone, um, you know, in this this situation. And now when we see our predator, predator, uh, perpetrators of racism and anti-blackness being more aggressive and more emboldened in how they express it. Folks are not afraid anymore and folks are not ashamed anymore. And so I think this is the context, the historical context that we have to think about when we talk about how are black minds and black minds engaged and policed in the context of education. And again, our focus for our discussion is going to be on post-secondary education, but I know our good friend and colleague, Dr. Tyrone Howard, um, did a remarkable job last week of talking about how this plays out in the, the K-12 context, context as well. And so I would encourage everyone to, to take a look at that discussion to get a sense of um, you know, how these two spaces are connected. And so Luke, um, you know, Dr. Estella ben Simone's concept of equity-mindedness has been transformational in my thinking and my understanding of systemic oppression and how we need to address it in the context of education. Now, we often think about education as the one tool that we have, the only tool that we have to bring about social justice and social liberation. But you and I know, Luke, we see countless examples of how it fails to be that for Black children and Black families. Yeah. And equity-mindedness essentially tells us that if, if education is going to fulfill um, its promise and potential, we need educators to pursue their work from an equity-minded perspective. And that means is that we have to be systemically aware. So we have to recognize that what we see in education, um, you know, in terms of, of racial exclusion and in terms of disproportionate impact and in terms of students, black students not being well served. Well, the same thing happens in other systems, other social systems. Almost every uh, social institution that touches the lives of black families and the lives of their loved ones. So we're thinking about healthcare, we're talking about the workforce, we're talking about the criminal justice system, right? They're, they're, they're black people and black lives are not well served in any of these contexts at all. Um, and then we also have to be racially conscious and racially affirming. So we have to not just see systemic oppression, you know, think about it in a general sense, but see it as a racial issue, right? And then as a part of that, we have to see students' racial identities, we have to affirm them and actually see them as assets that can be leveraged to influence their success. Um, you know, I think Tyron Howard spoke about this brilliantly last week in saying that despite everything that Black children go through, um, they still show up and they still perform in ways that, you know, perhaps ways that exceed our expectations or should exceed our expectations given all that is stacked up against them and all of the barriers and the atrocities and all the things that they experience, right? And so that speaks to not, that doesn't speak to, uh, you know, to the, uh, you know, we sort of shouldn't see that, see black, black kids and black families and black people through this deficit lens. That speaks to the, the brilliance and resilience, you know, of a, of a community of people. We also have to demand that our institutions uh, assume responsibility and accountability for the lives and the success of, of, of Black students, right? We got to get away from blaming students and their families as the reasons why they're not successful and demand that institutions assume some accountability for it. And we have to do the same thing personally. As educators, we have to accept and assume personal responsibility and accountability, right? So we have to see the success of Black students as an indication of our effectiveness as educators. And if they're not successful, then we really haven't done um, the jobs that we've been set out to do as educators. And then finally, we have to care about students and not just care about them in a casual sense, but care about them deeply, care about their lived experiences um, and about their success. And another concept, again, Luke, this is, this is not gonna be any surprise to you, is um, it's important to recognize that Systems and institutions of higher education are situated within a larger context that shape and influence it. And so our SEO model, uh, Luke, that we developed several years ago, which has served as a concept, the conceptual framework for all of our work and all of our thinking helps to underscore this. Of course, this is an abbreviated version of the model. And then when we look at the, the models um, constructs and kind of expand it, and 
which is a societal factor. And this construct captures the social issues that influence black students' dispositions towards education and how they see themselves as learners. And so we know that social stereotypes about black students, their intellectual abilities and their fit for college are situated here. And to kind of discuss some of the, the, the things that we see playing out in this construct, I want to highlight another tool that we developed, Loop, which is the 3D effect. And I know this, this concept was introduced uh, back in 2017 during the first launch of Black Minds Matter. So it's always good to kind of revisit it, especially knowing what we know now uh, three years later. But it's, it's still very much illuminating in many respects. And what the 3D effect tells us, it, it, it captures the three most prevailing stereotypes of Black students in education. Uh, the first D we describe as distrust, which relates to an description, uh, excuse me, which relates to um, the assumption that people of color, and uh, particularly men of color, are thugs and criminals and deviants and can't be trusted. The second D, disregard, uh, relates to an description of intelligence. And here, this is where we assume that black students are not only unprepared for college, but also intellectually inferior to other students. And then finally, we have the third D, which is um, disdain. And this relates to uh, educators' tendencies to pathologize the cultures and the communities that Black students come from, uh, where there's the assumption that they come from families and communities that don't value education. And in fact, Luke, you know, you and I, we've, we've actually heard that. We've heard educators articulate that very point uh, unapologetically in, in many of the places where we've, we've done work. And so, yes, you know, of have. course, this, this comes as no surprise to you. But the key point here is this, is that these stereotypes, um, you know, sometimes they're held unconsciously. So I know there's a lot of work around um, implicit bias and, and, and that work has been important in this regard as well. But uh, the fact of the matter is there are many educators, right? Educators who are trained, who have graduate degrees, and who are given the responsibilities of educating and serving and teaching black students that feel this way. And so obviously we, um, you know, we, we should, it should almost come as no surprise when we see some of the disparate outcomes that we see, um, you know, for our black students in post-secondary education. And then to further address this question about how are black lives and black minds policed in the context of education, we can just highlight some of the persistent challenges that Black students experience in post-secondary institutions, right? We know Black students are always overrepresented among those who experience uh, what we call basic needs and security. So, you know, lack of access to food and housing and transportation. And, you know, when we think about the context of COVID-19, uh, access to te reliable technology and Wi-Fi um, as a part of that as well. We know that there are pressures that are situated in the environmental domain of our SEO model, um, that we see that, 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 that these are selling it amongst black students. So the environmental domain talks about all of those factors that are situated outside of the context of the institution, but have a real salient influence on students' success, such as their work, their family commitments, financial pressures, and stressful life events, to name a few. Um, we've talked a little bit about racial microaggressions what we haven't talked about are racially hostile campus climates, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about shortly, but that's a, a persistent challenge for black students as well. Uh, deficit perspectives, we know that there are some educators, and I you know, spoke to this a little bit earlier, that believe that black students are not as intelligent, not as motivated, and not as committed to their academic pursuits. And consequently, that influences the time and the energy that educators invest towards getting to know and helping black students, right? So we often say, Luke, you know this, that deficit perspectives are self-fulfilling prophecies. If we believe that a student is not capable of being successful, doesn't belong in our, in our classrooms, doesn't belong in our counseling centers, then we're not going to invest the same time and energy and resources towards helping that student that we would another student. Um, the curriculum is also a real challenge here because we know that black students are rarely exposed to a curriculum that's culturally relevant and affirming. They rarely see positive images of themselves in the curriculum. They rarely get the opportunity to apply what they're learning to their lived experiences. And they rarely get to learn about Blacks who've made important intellectual contributions to the fields that they're studying. 
Um, and then, you know, lastly, on many, many college campuses, uh, we know that support for, for men of color, and particularly if we're talking about men, um, but we could also probably broaden this, you know, beyond men, is that most of the support for these students are designated to small programs, like maybe a minority male initiative or, you know, a similar program. And while these programs do amazing work and the colleagues who work in these programs go above and beyond what, what anyone can expect in terms of, you know, doing amazing work to support these students, they really shouldn't be the only unit on campus that's expected to engage in intentional efforts to support black students. And so um, these challenges, again, speak to how black minds and black lives are not valued and not well served in post-secondary education. Um, if I could continue a little for a few more minutes, Luke. Oh yeah, um, please do, please do. Before, before we get into Q and A, um, everything that I've, I've shared results in what Professor William Smith, who's you know one of our, our, our colleagues, and I would even say a mentor, an academic mentor for sure, um, at the University of Utah describes as racial battle fatigue. And Professor Smith's framework is incredibly illuminating in helping us recognize the cumulative effects of chronic racism and anti-blackness on college campuses. Now, the, the, a lot of, what a lot of scholars have focused on, and rightfully so, is on racial microaggressions, which I think is important to do, Luke. You know, you and I, we've, we've focused on that quite a bit in our own work. Um, but what I like about Smith's framework is that it extends this discussion by arguing that racism is not something that just happens ever so often for black students, but it's a phenomenon that affects nearly every aspect of our lives and our experiences in the academy, whether we're talking about students uh, or faculty or staff. And you know, because of the, the effects of racism are enduring, they're chronic, they, they actually become a core part of our life history and our identities as black people, as black educators for sure. So for example, you'd be hard pressed to ask a black person to describe what it is like to be black without somehow, uh, without them somehow talking about how racism um, and anti-blackness has had some impact on their identities. And then Smith also likens racial battle fatigue to combat stress syndrome. And this is what soldiers experience um, when they are in combat zones, um, that, that where, where the risk of being attacked or killed is ever present. And so consequently, when we look at the, the experiences of black students, and I'll even broaden it to black people in the academy, they often experience a range of physiological effects, which we see here, um, and psychological effects, which we see presented here as well. And you know what's interesting about this is that these symptoms, what Smith does is link these symptoms directly to racial battle fatigue. And unfortunately, many of these symptoms are often misdiagnosed or uh, erroneously attributed to factors other than racialized stress. We know that there are very, you know, very few of our colleagues who have training in mental health, um, you know, has any real intentional uh, training on being able to recognize and diagnose and treat racial battle fatigue. And so what we see here um, it's, it's sort of a vicious, vicious cycle. The more time that you spend immersed in, um, in educational environments, higher education environments, the more likely you are to be exposed to racial battle fatigue and its effects. And um, we also have to recognize this, Luke, that the policing of black lives and black minds in education, that they, they play out somewhat uniquely for black students who identify as boys and men. And what I'm not trying to do here is offer a comparative perspective. You know, this is not a, you know, boys and men versus, you know, girls and women, you know, our trans identified folks, or, you know, I, this is not, it's not about making comparison along the, the, the gendered spectrum, but I do want to speak, um, you know, a little bit specifically about what we know and what we see with regard to men, boys, men, and masculinity. Um, we know we live in a, a, a social context that directly aligns masculinity with a set of values and expectations that are not only toxic from a health and well-being perspective, but also detrimental to learning and intellectual growth and the personal development that is supposed to take place in post-secondary education. Um, a big concern here is that black boys and men are taught uh, to embrace a version of masculinity that they can never ever really fully attain because masculinity in the US, as we know, 
is really modeled on the basis of, of white cultural norms, right? And so men of color can never really fully access and exercise what, you know, the, the masculine ideal in the United States because it was never developed, you know, for, you know, black boys, black men, uh, or men of color, you know, it, it, you know to, to sort of describe it um, broadly. And so because of racial prejudice, because of racial exclusion, because of systemic racism, uh, you know, as, as, as men of color, we can never live up to what it means to be a man in the United States. And as a consequence, what ends up happening is that, you know, black boys and men often develop alternative forms of masculinity and perform behaviors that allow them to both convey strength and control while dealing with the effects of systemic oppression. And this is what Majors and Bilson describe as cool pose. And one of the more transparent examples that we see with regard to black boys um, as early as middle school and certainly by high school is that black boys um, often fully buy into an athletic identity and completely reject the scholarly identity because being an athlete is one of the more accessible, if not the only ways that they're validated and appreciated by both educators and by their peers. And so consequently, you know, what that means is that, um, uh, what that means is that uh, these alternative expressions of masculinity, they leave no room for black boys and men to be anything that falls outside of this narrowly and socially constructed notion of what it means to be a black man, right? So that means there's no room for, for being vulnerable, there's no room for showing any emotions other than anger and you know, perhaps frustration. There's no room for doing anything that could be perceived as being weak or soft. There's no room for asking for help. There's no room for being dependent. And essentially what this means is that you know, to, to, as a man, you can really only care or be invested in, in, in anything. Um, you can only be invested in those things that advance your own self-interest, right? So there's some implications for relationships and a lot of other things that we see. And Luke, you know, my last point here in the last slide uh, before you know, we turn it over to you, back to you with engaging some Q&A is that we see this play out in very concrete and consequential ways in our work on black men in post-secondary education. We see four patterns uh, of masculinity that we see on a consistent basis. We see our, our, our black men, um, they express an apprehension to seeking help even when they're on the verge of failing even when they're struggling and not willing to seek out help when they need it. Uh, there's a tendency to see schooling as this feminine space and feminine domain, again, because schooling is, is, is more of an academic uh, pursuit and they've, uh, they've learned to associate anything that's scholarly and academic with being feminine. There's a tendency to view their, their, their post-secondary experiences strictly through a breadwinner orientation. So I'm here because I need to get a job that's going to help me earn more money to take better care of my family, right? It's not about my interests. It's not about figuring out what I'm good at. It's, this, is, this is nothing more than, than um, you know, a breadwinner orientation exercise. And then there's this notion of hyper-competitiveness where the idea that as a guy, you're supposed to outcompete everyone. And if you can't effectively and successfully um, be competitive in this academic space, then I'm going to leave this I'm going to go off and do something that is where I'm, I'm more likely to be able to be successful in fulfilling this, this expectation of being competitive. And uh, with that, I will stop there, Luke, because I'm sure, you know, you have some questions for me and uh, I'm looking forward to the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, if you could actually stop the screen share, then it'd be a little. Of course. Yep. So first of all, Powerful, amazing as as always, brother. Um, very very well done. There's, there's a lot of different things that you went over, but I want to really hone in on on this notion of, of masculinity. Our, our black boys and, and black men don't fall into that in, in line with that concept. Yeah. And so I don't even know that if you if you walk into a space and tell educators, okay, you need to validate validate your males of color. Most of them wouldn't even know how to do that. A lot of them are afraid. They're afraid of these guys, right? Because or they might, also, they might try to validate them and cause more damage. Right. And <laughs> you microaggress, right? And, 
And also, and, but this goes back to something I shared at the very beginning of our conversation, right? Education, um, we're trying to transform a system of education that was never intended for black lives and black minds to begin with, right? Like the education, the system of education that we see in 2020 is in many ways rooted in the same core values um, that, 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 that it was established with centuries ago, right? And just because we have, we as you know, black people have, have now been afforded some space and some opportunity for participation, the system it, you know, at its core is still the same. Um, and so that's why we continue to, no matter what we do, and no matter how hard we work, we continue to see you know, little evidence of progress because so much of what we're trying to do is transform a system and transform you know, a structure that was never designed for our participation. So what do community. you do? How do you transform it? Because- Well, you have, you know, we have colleagues, um, you know, uh, Dr. Ed Bush is one, for example, yeah. uh, who's the president of, of Consumnes River College, a community college in Sacramento, who says, you know, we, really, we, we, need to, we need to like, we need to start over. You know, we need, to, we need to design schools and we need to design institutions that, uh, that, that are established from the very beginning at its origins for educating black people, right? Where the curriculum is unapologetically black and, and how educators are trained to teach in those institutions, um, that they're trained with a, an understanding of black lives and an appreciation of black lives and you know, the, the uh, cultural wealth that black people bring, right? Some people say, we, we gotta kind of start over. Um, I, I, I don't know, I'm, um, you know, maybe because I am an educator, I, I still have some optimism. I still think there's, uh, there's some hope for transforming the current system, but we gotta, we have to go about it much more, um, you know, I, we have to do, we have to do it differently than what we've been doing. Uh, yeah. We have to radically re-envision what it, what it looks like. If we don't see more black faculty uh, and staff hired, if we don't see more black students graduated with honors and, and you know, being in, enrolled in the institution and, and graduating in a reasonable time frame with, you know, with, with less student loan debt. And you know, if, we don't, if we don't see tangible evidence of progress, you know, the statements that you make and, you know, black lives. And I mean, it's, 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 it's much, it's a lot of the same stuff. Well, um, uh, but I think the first, let me, let me answer this really quickly because I know you're probably gonna say, okay, Frank, that sounds all fine and good, but where do we start? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing we have to do is recognize that as a system and as institutions, we have a problem. Like it, we need to kind of revisit and reckon, you have some reconciliation you know, of the history and legacy of racism in our institution, right? So that means that, for example, you know, we need to look at all the, all the policies and practices that were, yep. first, like, I, let me go back. We need to look at how black bodies were actually so used to build these institutions, right? And how black bodies were sold to fund these, like we got, kind of got to start there. And then, right? Yeah. And so it's not just about having access to an institution, it's about having equitable, equitable access where I learn about myself, where my identity is for, affirmed, and where my likelihood of being successful is just as good as anybody else that attends here. And we know that that is not the case at almost any institution of higher education in our country, right? Maybe, you know, the HBCUs, um, you Maybe know, obviously would be, would be a notable exception to that, yeah. but nowhere else. And so the effects are still there, right? The, um, the impact is still there. You know, I, I, I kind of want to end with a quote that you and I, that, that, that has really informed our work. I think you know what's coming, Luke. Yep. Is every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it gives. Nothing that we've talked about today that happens to black lives and black minds and education is by accident. It's all by design. And so if we want to change what happens, then we have to change the system. Um, if we're not happy with the results, we have to change we have to change what we do. And so okay. I thank you, brother. I salute you, man. You know, um, you know, I love you. I love working with you. 
Likewise. And you inspire me every day, man. So, um, and I, I don't know that I would have the fire and passion that I that I have without without the partnership that you and I have established for for you know nearly a decade. And so we got more work to do, and I'm looking forward to it. Likewise, brother. We um, are only able to do this work because we've been able to do it together. Appreciate it, and thank no you. No doubt. Brother. All right. Thank you, brother. All right, everyone, we are very grateful today to have Dr. Ebony Zamani Gallagher with us uh, from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, she is an accomplished scholar. She is a personal friend. She is a brilliant intellectual who's done incredible work um, throughout the pipeline, but has really been dedicated to focusing on what does the Black student experience look like in our community colleges. So again, Dr. Zamani Gallagher, thank you for being here. Thank you both for having me, Drs. Ford and Wood. Um, it is a pleasure to have this time with you all. And I particularly want to um, just say that I appreciate uh, this opportunity to be able to also kind of give a backdrop and um, kind of problematize and, and underscore the importance of community colleges and um, trying to have racially equitable experiences as well as outcomes um, for Black folk as it relates to our two-year um, context. But, you know, for while we're here, right, and we talk about Black minds mattering, um, and in a couple of years uh, prior to this, um, as we talked about Black minds mattering and Black minds mattering as um, just one component of the overarching um, you know, cry, a clarion call for Black lives mattering. Um, I wanted to just spend a little bit of time um, kind of bridging the two of those um, with regard to if we matter, then folk would put their money where their mouth is. So what do I mean by that? I mean that to say that there is something about race, that original scar um, and sin of this country whereby, you know, we have an economy uh, that was built on the backs of slaves and their descendants and on stolen land from native peoples. Um, and yet none of these populations, our folk, indigenous folk, have ever been um, given our just due. And one case in point of that is if you were to look at the slide here around median earnings by race and gender, while often you know folks will lament, particularly white women, about there being a glass ceiling. Um, you know, we also know that race exacerbates um, that glass ceiling for women of color in the workplace. As you can see here, uh, irrespective of uh, gender, while we see that um, white men make more, that white women make more than their female counterparts of color, um, that there is, again, um, this interaction, um, the intersectionality uh, and multiplicity of race and gender uh, with respect to how we are compensated for our gifts and our talents and our time. Another thing that I wanted to, uh, to raise relative to this was to just kind of look at it by education, right? We need a value proposition sometimes when it comes to post-secondary education. And as uh, Dr. Luke just mentioned a little while ago, um, the primary post-secondary pathway for so many students of color, and namely Black students, um, our Black colleges are not necessarily at four-year institutions, but they are robustly at community colleges. But irrespective of educational uh, attainment, what we do see, again, is this Black tax, in that when we have all other things controlled for, Black folk that have uh, the same educational uh, credentials, if you will, um, when, con when contrast to uh, their Asian, Hispanic, and white counterparts, um, that there is a opportunity gap um, as well as a gap relative to what we see in their labor market um, participation in addition to the slide that I just shown there, compensation, um, whereby Black folks are um, underemployed and more readily um, are experiencing unemployment. So when we talk about COVID and what has been really curious to me is, um, you know, people saying, well, you know, I'm really trying to respond to COVID. We have all these meetings relative to COVID and we know that there's racial unrest at present. And so we're going to get to that too. 
um, the, the additive kind of nature with which um, we're going to get to that too, as if it is something to tack on when these things are not to be coupled and are really inextricably linked. So if you want to address COVID on your respective campuses, you can do so in a way that is very much married to addressing racialized inequities relative to the economic loss that Black folk are experiencing relative to issues of um, inaccessibility um, that has presented itself relative to a widening digital divide and opportunity, you name it. But for you know what it's worth with us saying that education um, can lend itself to greater mobility, um, it can. But again, you know, when we talk about all lives mattering, that is not the case here in terms of black lives mattering and black minds mattering, because even when we have um, a bachelor's degree or higher, as you can see, um, we are the ones that are experiencing unemployment and much higher numbers um, and, and disproportionate numbers. One of the things that has uh, been very concerning for me um, from one year to the next, and while I don't put a lot of um, you know, emphasis or focus into placement testing, testing or um, you know, college interest exams, but just the fact that you know, we have these benchmarks and, and you know, for what they're worth, to see that um, we have only roughly four out of, um, or I'm sorry, two out of five, right? Okay, roughly 45% of all students, irrespective of their background, are meeting um, the college and career readiness benchmarks. We see what plays out when disaggregating the data and looking at it at a more in a more granular fashion. That you know, while it's abysmal that out of all students, irrespective of their background, that only you know roughly forty five percent are deemed ready for college or career. When we look at just by race and ethnicity. What is showing us as a pattern, and this has been year in, year in and year out, is whether it's English or mathematics, reading or science, that black minds um, apparently don't matter in, a, in the way of uh, these educators relative to the benchmarks and doing what can be uh, done to a, at least uh, mitigate what has been exacerbated by race relative to opportunities, um, in terms of the opportunity gap and achievement gaps between within as well as between groups. One of the things I also wanted to um, spend some time touching on was to look at within um, the two-year sector, if you will, as well as post-secondary post-secondary education, um, generally speaking, uh, is it's not just that they enter, but where they enter. So when we look at the enrollment, whether it is four year or two year, what we see as a pattern is that white and Asian students are more readily going um, in terms of their first institution and initial enrollment and post-secondary are at four year institutions. Whereas uh, black and brown folk, uh, again, uh, are at the door seals of two year uh, institutions. And then when we look at those that are leaving that two-year institution with degrees in hand, we again see not just an equity gap writ large, but we see a gap that is racialized in equities. Um, and so think about this when broken down by race and gender that we see again, a larger share of degree holders at the associate's level those completers are white students. Um, I will give you a footnote in terms of the numbers being so small for Asian men and women is also um, in lieu of having what is an overrepresentation um, in the four year sector and namely at elite institutions. So you see uh, more of the conferral there. Um, but again, we have these gaps that have been persistent. We see the gaps relative to transfer as well. You know, transfer as one kind of form and effort in terms of uh, a way to get through and navigate from one sector to the next has a lot of promise. But, you know, transfer rates have have not been very desirable for decades. But what we do see in terms of who is readily transferring, again, are white and Asian students, that they are moving from two year to four year um, more seamlessly. And Black and Hispanic students are uh, less likely to be transferring or transferring at least at, at, uh, at shorter rates, um, smaller rates, if you will. 
And, you know, I think part of when we talk about one and a half equitable outcomes, let's be clear. When it comes to students of color, we have to think about person and environment fit. We have to think about cultural congruency of fit. And we have to think about who is there, who's in front of them relative to our staff, the administrators, the faculty. Here I have a slide with the faculty, right? And I've always talked about, you know, um, that adage of, you know, higher ed being the ivory towers. Well, they don't call it the ivory towers for nothing. Um, and it doesn't have to be just something that's, you know, um, the two year or the four year, but it's across all types of contexts, right? So whether it's a, you know, a research one intensive institution or uh, a liberal arts, a doctoral granting um, or community college, um, you know, the faculty is, is largely white. At least four out of five faculty across institutional types are white faculty. Yet and still, that is not necessarily kept pace and is representative with the increasingly culturally pluralistic and diverse college students that are coming to our campuses two and four year alike. Um, the faculty, the staff, the administrators, they've not yet kept pace. And representation, it matters, right? And so to be affirmed um, within that setting um, also is something that we can't um, underscore enough relative to how students experience the campus, how students are able to have additional navigational and cultural capital and um, move and persist in terms of matriculating to completion. You know, I'm a Chicagoan. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I'm a proud Shy City girl. Um, and I hail from the South Side. That's the best side. You know, and um, one of the things that is uh, prickly for me, um, and particularly um, the last couple years, is with this administration um, out of the White House, um, you know, diverting uh, attention away from some of the failures of their own uh, responses across whether it's education or health, um, policing, um, you know, criminal justice and the like, but, you know, trying to point a finger at, but look at Chicago. Um, well, you know, let's just talk about the backdrop of, of Illinois, talk about, you know, my hometown, but I want to say that this is not an anomaly, but that this is what we're seeing play out across um, the country in terms of concerns. We had black and brown men at the various campuses that we visited in our field work tell us time and time again that one of the chief barriers and challenges um, to them persisting and matriculating, to them having an experience uh, at their respective campuses that was affirming was the interactions with campus safety, with campus police. Um, time and time again, we were told about how tiring it is to be surveilled, to have to legitimize their existence, to have to justify um, why they're present. Um, I remember one young man telling, um, you know, my uh, colleagues and I that he, uh, you know, kind of fell asleep. It was during um, exam week um, and he was awakened by an officer and he said people, white people in terms of students, um, were walking all around, saw a couple other white kids that were also laid out, um, but that, you know, no one was asked for their ID or others saying, you know, um, you know, they see the cop car, you know, campus police just kind of trailing them and just waiting to see and just watching them or time and time again, I need to see your ID. What are you doing here? Where are you headed to? And swirling around um, you know, and he, I remember one guy said, uh, a person, he said, there was this guy that looked disheveled, didn't even look collegiate, you know, like a collegiate, you know, he wasn't collegiate at all. I, I'm sitting up here with a polo on, I got my backpack and I'm being stopped while scruffy white dudes are walking just, you know, freely and easily without being asked, um, you know, why are you here? You know, so it's, it's a continual um, reminder of, we don't think you belong here. And so that that is actually happening on two year campuses as well. Um, and so we see the, the stops, the questioning. Um, we see, you know, again, when we think about just this um, one example I have here with, um, you know, Chicago, uh, that we have almost three times more often the, the number of times that black and brown folk are, are stopped. 
Um, you know, so that there is some people think that these are isolating events. No, that is a thing driving while black um, searching the car. This has happened to me. Um, people go, oh, no, that couldn't have happened to you. No, that has happened to me where I have been pulled over. I was asked to not even asked. I was told to get out of my car. I was frisked. I was, my head was pushed into the you know hood of my car. My car was searched. And it was only upon them seeing a fraternal order of policing decal in my glove box where, you know, I shared that my father had been um, on the force that, you know, oh, well, you have a good evening. Can't be too careful. So these things are happening, right, routinely. We got other concerns. When we think about um, issues of poverty, you know, uh, first half of my career I did a lot of work around affirmative action. One of the arguments I would hear time and time again is we shouldn't have race conscious forms of affirmative action. We um, should have what would be economic based, right? Um, if we could just focus on income, then you know it was that rising tide lifts all boats kind of approach. But that does not approach get at and eradicate, right? Remediate racism, right? And racialized inequities. Um, you know, because particularly when we talk about poverty, again, black tax, uh, you know, black folk are more readily at higher disproportionate rates living at or beneath the poverty line. Right. So we see this here. We see this any number of places nationwide. Again, right here at home, when we talk about, um, you know, security and we're in the midst of COVID. So, you know, you've heard that that saying of last hired, first fired. More often than not, those that are experiencing joblessness during this time, um, you know, again, in more pronounced ways are black folks. Right. Um, many people. Right. Irrespective of background are, are living check to check. But it is even um, more dire in, in many cases um, for black folk. And then when we talk about discipline. And Luke, some of the work that you've done at SEAL, um, you and Frank, um, again, has highlighted this um, disconnect as well as many other, you know, brother, sister scholars where we see time and time again that um, there is a particular surveilling and policing of Black bodies. And this is done so within the confines of educational um, structures, right, within our schools and on our campuses. What do you? What is the words that you have for black students? What do they? What do they need to hear? Whether I'm doesn't matter to me what level of education they're in, but what do they need to know about getting through that that rough that rough experience? Mm -hmm. Is I would share with folks that the only way over is through, right? And so that, irrespective of all of the the craziness that is um, kind of. Um, you know, happening around us, that um, they should not have that to um, envelop them in such a way that it takes their eyes off the prize. And to understand that, um, you know, again, power concedes nothing, you know, as we're all kind of, um, you know, thinking about in mourning, just having lost, um, you know, two of our key you know, civil rights leaders um, back to back, um, you know, this past weekend. But, you know, when we think about, um, you know, as, as John Lewis would say, getting into good trouble, that I would encourage young folk to do that. Um, because, you know, with each generation, um, we've had to have, um, you know, that kind of speaking truth to power and, and contesting. It has never been, like ever been, where, you know, um, it wasn't contested. I mean, because uh, being Black in this country has, has, has never been anything in terms of free, and we are still trying to um, get to that, you know, come full circle on that. It's never happened in terms of um, our freedoms. They ain't been free. And so now it's their generation's turn. Um, it's all of our collective um, responsibility to um, get in there. It is arguable if you're woke. And if, in fact, you are awake and or awoke, what I do need you to do, however, is to not continue to hit the snooze button. Because there's a whole bunch of folk out here talking about they woke, right? They're awake, and yet they still have little awareness and or they're aware 
and consciously choose to opt in and opt out. And, you know, using a gen ed example, this ain't an elective. This is core. This shit's required, right? You don't get to just elect to if you really are about it, right? Um, and you don't get to just keep pressing snooze. You know, you heard the alarm. Wake up. <laughs> get to it. Uh, something triggered my mind uh, to think about Horace Mann, who talked about education being the greatest equalizer. And mm -hmm. I always, especially when I was younger, believed that. But now we see, well, not just now, um, but we see this really not happening. So how do you convince students you're working with that education really does matter and is better than no education? I was about to say Detroit Red, but Malcolm X had um, talked about, you know, when white folks see, you know, a brother with a PhD, he just, they just see another N word, right? Um, and in many cases, that is it. I mean, I don't know how many folks uh, of color in the academy, particularly black folk, um, you know, that have had this experience of when they have walked into a classroom and you know, it's like, oh, well, you weren't what I was expecting, right? Well, what, is a, what does a college professor look like? You know, what were you expecting? Um, you know, particularly for those that don't have names like mine, they, they know somebody, Chocolate City showing up when I come. They just, they, they get a little confused by the last name because it's like African and Irish kind of put them like, who's coming? Who's coming to class? Um, you know, but that kind of thing. So I think that no, it's not an equalizer. Um, it never was given that folk that um, are not as credentialed that are white um, have a complexion for protection more often than not in terms of still being able to um, be hired, have greater earnings um, and, and more financial stability. Um, you know, when you look at the data, you know, over the last, you know, several decades, if not, you know, longer. So, uh, but, you know, without it, it, it becomes increasingly harder, um, you know, and so it's, it's much better, like I say, to stay the course and, and to do it, because then you will find yourself um, able to have uh, more options than not. Years, okay, sorry, years ago, um, I, I started thinking about, uh, how the experiences of white women are very different from those of black women and other minoritized um, women. And I think we need to have more discussion about that. But um, I think the, f the phrase um, glass ceiling, while it may be appropriate for white women, for us is a plexiglass or you give us, give me another kind of glass. It is not the regular glass. You, I hope that, that makes sense. So plexiglass ceiling for us and that's the thing is i think um you know what happens to or at least it's um it's been often enough where i've heard folks talk about well you know well let's just talk about the gender piece and the glass ceiling you know and so like that that is the place where um we can even, you know, uh, the conversation, right? We're all women here. We all um, have experienced the glass ceiling and it's like, hold on. Okay, one is we're all women here, but also there needs to be an acknowledgement that um, we do not have the same experiences. And that while sexism may be the ultimate ism um, to you that trumps all other isms, it's just one of many you know, that we are um, dealing with. Well, with that, Ebony, we just want to thank you so much for, for the wisdom that you brought to us today and for being a repeat guest on, on Black Minds Matter. We knew that if we were doing um, this third version of the class, there was no way that we were doing it without the great Ebony Zamani Gallagher and all the work that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate you, your dedication to the community and to your dedication to Black Minds Matter. And thank you for making the time to make this possible. Yes, thank you so much. Thank I'm you. at my mother's house. I'm at my mother's house. This is where it all started. So let's go. All right, everyone. We are very, very privileged today to have 
um, Michael Brown, senior father of, of Michael Brown Jr. We'd like to kind of begin with just a more general question. Can you tell us about Michael? What was he like? Well, well, Michael was a quiet guy, outgoing guy, um, more personal with himself. Um, get becoming becoming older, um, just experiencing different things like other kids, you know, touching this. I know that it's hot. I know that's cold. I know that not to touch. You know, um, coming into junior high, you know, he had a uh, he had a friend. He had a couple of friends that died got killed in junior high. You know, uh, one of his friends was named Big Mike. He used to play, because Mike used to play uh, instruments in junior high. So one of his friends that used to play the trombone, he had got killed. He was one of the kids of uh, Me Hungry. Uh, it's, it's, called, it's a barbecue place, Me Hungry. And um, somebody came up and robbed his father and the guy got, the, the young guy got killed in the process. So he's he been through a whole lot in the beginning. He had questions and he was trying to find himself. Uh, he liked the girls, you know, he liked computers. Uh, he knew how to drive. Uh, he knew how to break things down and fix them. You know, uh, he was just a normal kid to me. It's my son, you know. So whatever he was doing that I knew that I had in me, he did even times more, you know. And... Uh, he just was greatly loved. Um, sadly, he was on his way to college and he got killed, you know, but he had accomplishments. I guess he, he felt like he accomplished a couple of things that he had to do in his life because he had a different, like, he had a different type of life where he used to talk to me and Cal, which is his stepmother, like, on different levels. You know, it, it wasn't like he knew that this was going to happen to him, but he talked different from an average 18 year old. He talked like a 30 year old, you know? So it was almost like, man, he, he knew his passion, he knew his love, he knew what he needed to do. I'm still proud of him. I'm proud of him from the grave. You know, he's still doing work, you know? So that, that's that's who Mike Brown Jr. is, you know? Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, it really is so important and, resonates with me as um, a parent. Yeah, yep. he's, he's, as of now, he's helping other families because of what happened with him and impacted the world when it happened to him. And that was the kickoff of our millennium. You know, we know about uh, Emmett Till and we know about other families and, and it's all respect and love, you know, and they in their time. But this is like our time. You know, that what happened in our life while we're alive and that we understand and what we see and we're trying to figure out why is this still happening. But the dead speak. Well, let's see that picture behind you of your yes, son. Ma yes, ma'am. <laughs> this was the picture that we took when me and Cal had gotten married. Okay. Well, we definitely have to, you know, see his face and say his name. Black yes, lives matter. Black minds matter. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That's a good. Yes, thank you for that. So you said he was off to college. Can you tell us more about that? What was it? What was it like in like in school for him? Oh man, let's talk about let's talk about the real stuff. Yes. That was hard. That was hard, brother. <laughs> now that was hard. Um, I will say, um, I don't. I don't mention his mother's name unless it's her permission. But he was with he, he was with her and he transitioned with me in Cal. And uh, we had a conversation and he was like, okay, I'm gonna go to school. But then he went to school and he was like, Dad, I don't wanna go no more. And I'm like, dude, you got to go. What 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 you mean you don't wanna go? He was saying that things was moving a little too fast for him. Then he brought up uh, a conversation with me and Cal. Well, to Cal. And uh, it was about a PAL center, which is a part of, it's a group for um, not slow kids, but kids that kids that have too many people in their classroom and they just can't catch on, you know. And uh, he was able to take that class. And uh, it was all, 
red flags after the, you know. And then when it was brought to me, she was like, Cal was like, I was going to tell you what this is what he wanted to do. And he, he knew this was going to work out for him. And I was like, I'm glad you did take that choice, you know. And uh, I'm glad he's doing better in school and wants to stay in school now, you know, because yeah, he really wanted, he really was ready to give up. But uh, that that choice there, it was it was great for him. And you said he was uh, ready to give up. What, what was it about school? Was it you said it was good? It was moving too fast. But were there other any other concerns? Um, it definitely. It, it the thing about it was they had the, the classrooms was overpopulated at the time, you know. So and then you don't have you can have teachers that wanted to take the time to just go one by one to make sure everybody got it, you know. And he's my son. He got. I, I get frustrated. I know he got frustrated, and uh, gladly that someone had brought a packet or saying that this program was coming to the school too, and it and it cut down the students. You know where it probably was six students in the class, you know something like that, and it was it made it easier for him to understand and be able to focus because that's what it's about. You know we all get frustrated when we can't focus. You know, we know we can get it, and we, you know, it, we just get frustrated, you know. So, personally, I think there was just too many kids in the classroom. He just couldn't get it, yeah. you know. And then when we got him in a position where it was broke down, you know, he was the one that was doing most of the talking. Those other kids weren't talking in the class, mm -hmm. you know. And that's like, this guy is our best student. But we're in a time to where... People are scared of children. <laughs> mm. Let's just be real. Let's just, let's talk facts now. We got we got we got time that people are scared of children, you know, because we don't know what they've been through or they act in a certain type of way we don't want to deal with, it, you know. And I feel personally that that's wrong, you know. One of the things that I want to ask um, deals with both police officers and with teachers. Um, I want to know what do you think is important for both those people, those communities to know, both police officers and teachers, so that they can better serve black communities? I met a lot of white teachers that uh, they just want to be their students' friends, right? But the students do not trust them because of their culture. And I heard it all the time. I'm just, I'm being real with you, you know. I heard it all the time. So I'm like, you know, and they ask me, like, what can I do? And I tell them, just listen. So if you do feel like that's a friend and they want to just vent, just listen. As far as police officers, they got to get back on the beat. There was a time we always had a chance to see police officers that was in your own community and not from the boondocks coming in with no knowledge on how to deal with black people to where, you know, they were getting out the car, jumping rope with kids, you know, um, throwing the football up and down the street, getting to know you, getting to know your neighbor, getting to know the people that's around you, you know, getting to know uh, your circumstances because of how your, your upbringing is. So when it comes to people that don't understand us and just want to pull up on us and just criminalize us off of just our color. That's bad. And those people are, do not need to be in our communities. You know, and and you have these people that just want to get a check. And by them getting these checks, they're killing us. They are killing us. It really and seems it like I know you, <laughs> like I know you from this interview, even for this interview, because I talk about that, too. And so does, um, you know, Luke Wood. Um, and I hate to use this phrase and I'm sorry if it's offensive, but I call it drive by teaching, drive in, get their paycheck and do a lot of damage. So we need to go back to having teachers, as you said, and police officers who live in the community. We have people that, sadly, we have people that's qualified for 
um, jobs that don't really pay that much, and they are basically white. And they are coming in because there's some of them that do care. And uh, they are trying their best to just be friendly and be, but we have so many, so many kids that see, they see the damage that's been done, and they don't really know how to express themselves when they're that age. You know, when they're that age, and they have this white person telling them, "You can talk to me about anything. I will help you with anything," and they don't want to trust it. You know, so we have to definitely take back over. You know, I think police officers need to pay for their own insurance. I don't even think we should be governing nothing. You know, I don't think when a police officer kill an uh, uh, innocent black man or it's just fired that he, got, he killed the innocent black child, I think that all those rights need to be taken away and we shouldn't be funding or paying for nothing. You know, I feel like things should be on some type of points to where your points that ran out you ain't got no insurance, you can't work here. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to go, sir. You know, uh, we, 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 we are relieving of you or your duties. You know what I'm saying? Because you're paying for your own insurance. They're not going to cover it. They know it was wrong. And you have to leave. And then the next process, whichever, if they're going to get charged or whatever, that's when that comes in. Because these police officers are getting these pay reliefs, and we're still paying for them. I, 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 it's just so many things that I feel like just need to change. You know, we, we're still taking care of these these crooked cops or, or bad cops or misunderstood cops. But what kind of a person want to just look at it? We're still taking care of them. Yeah. You know. So, so what do you want to happen? Um, and then, um, Luke, I'll, I'll stop. So what do you want to happen, Mr. Brown, to pay more homage to your son who was murdered by the, just, by the police? I just don't want nobody to never forget, you know, never forget whatever happened. You know, what, what happened uh, August 9th, 2014. You know, I want people to know and understand that he was he was loved. He was a black man, a black man that was gonna have kids and children in the future later on in his life. He still had loved ones, he had siblings, he had a father, he had got a mother, he had a stepmother, he got a stepfather. He was human. So you I when you're talking about both police officers and teachers, I heard three big things come out. Mm -hmm. One is that people have to be willing to listen. The Mm -hmm. second is that there has to be trust. And the Mm -hmm. third, that you have to be in the community, not just Mm -hmm. in and out. Is there Mm -hmm. any other thing that you'd want to leave educators with that you'd want them to hear beyond those three things? We just have to just come to some type of common ground with us as a people, you know what I'm saying? Because I say, well, when I say with us, with the people, we have to be on one accord, and then we can get the respect that we earn, we we yearning for. I would like to get a website so where people can donate if they choose to, and let them know what we still been doing since 2014. You know, and definitely give y'all a shout out, and definitely give a shout out to the protests and the people that stood up for the families when we didn't have the heart or the soul or the strength to even do anything but just try to greet, dehumanizing him, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and people just like treating him like he's just a bag on the street and just, you know, it just, I'm his voice and I have to speak, I have to speak for him because he can't speak for himself, you know what I'm saying? Now, Michael Brown, chose for change, dot com. What can they do when they go there? Is that is that an opportunity to donate? Yes, sir. Um, yes, I do not want to ask this question, but I just have to. It's come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's get it. Let's go. <laughs> when all of these murders are happening, this should have been earlier. Does it does it open up wounds and scars to, and tear scars for you, or have you found a way to cope with it? No, nah, it's never. You know, like George Floyd, etc. 
when when I I wasn't I wasn't gonna look at that video which was for it, right? And uh, I opened it up because I don't know if it was the same way that that was on you guys' phone, where you had to click and and make it play, and it showed you what actually happened. I clicked and let it play, and I just got disgusted. My chest got to hurt, my head started to hurt. I called uh, Anthony Shahi. I called Anthony Shahi, and I told him we need to get to Minnesota. Um, it, a few days went past, and we was in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. You know, and the energy that was there because people had to realize that some some things I can't remember when it all happened because that trauma had my mind in a tunnel when it was happening to me. And we were being pulled and yanked and going from city to city. So, you know, I really can't tell you what was really going on, but what y'all was saying on TV too, you know. And uh, when we had a chance to come back, especially when we came back from Geneva, you know, the protests were still going on, you know. We went to the United Nations to talk to these people about the crimes and stuff that's going on in the United States, you know. But uh, when we were, when me and Brother Shahid was over there, it was just the energy was just like, man, powerful. The people was just like, man, it, I, it just took me back to 2014, you know. Um, the wounds, the wounds that you were asking about, yeah, they were open, but I was able to. How do I explain this? I was able to see it in a different, in a different perspective, but I knew the, I knew the feeling though. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I understand, but I'm right here now. See, on I, on our situation, we was being traveled around. So I really went with the people, but the people was doing what they what they knew what was best, you know, on on uh, on, uh, on truth, you know. So I was part of the, I was part of the people that know what's best on truth on this end. So I was able to be with the people, talk to the people, be in the whole atmosphere of where it happened, at, feel the energy. You know, uh, look at the burn down. See the burn downs while I'm down there. You know, it, it just, it was just a different type of feel, you know. And yeah, definitely, though. But to answer your question, yes, yes, ma'am, it was, it was a repeat. You it said that after it happened, you felt compelled to go. What, what, what was it that, what, what was it that compelled you? What did you want to do? What did you want to accomplish? I want to help their family. I definitely want to go down there and help their family. I want them to know that they have people that, you know, understand and will be there with them all the way through. This is definitely a fraternity that nobody want to join. Nobody. I don't wish this on the enemy if I had one. You know, so you have to be in a position where you have to console family members and, and let them know it's somebody at two, three, four, five, six o'clock in the morning when you're about to spaz out. It's somebody that you can call. You know, and and and, and you talking to a person that understands you, not trying to understand you. You know, like when this stuff happened with me, Uncle Bobby, which is uh uh Oscar Grant's uh, uh uncle and uh, Joy, uh, Ryan Davis, which is Jordan Davis with the Loud Music out of Florida. His father and uh, uh, Tracy Morton, which is Trey Vine's father. They came to St. Louis. They came and talked to me when this stuff was going on. I really wasn't able to understand where they was coming from because I was tunnel vision and I don't know where my mind was. I can't really even tell you where I was, but I wasn't in the right state, you know. And that's, I don't have to explain that, but y'all know what I'm saying. But, uh, yeah. yeah, but I had people that reached out to me 
to try to help me. So this is what I have to do for other families. Yeah. We, we we greatly appreciate it. Um, and we will make sure to, to share the, the links with everyone and encourage people to go and do the great work that you're doing. And again, thank you for, for sharing your time with us. No problem. Thank you for having me.